Welcome to the Bible Church of Lakeshore. This is our Sunday evening service. Last few weeks, we, we did cancel our Sunday evening service. And tonight, we are resuming now that we've come a little closer to figuring out this technology. And I won't go on about any of that any further. Tonight, I wanted to follow Luke's account of Jesus' Passion Week following Palm Sunday. You see, Palm Sunday, Jesus came in with his triumphal entry, as we just looked at in the book of Luke this morning. And shortly thereafter, he leaves and goes back to Bethany. He will re-enter Jerusalem quietly Monday morning and go to the temple, where things will not be as quiet early that morning. He will cleanse the temple. And that's where we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 19 this evening. Tonight I wanted to follow some of the events in this Passion Week going into Tuesday in Luke's account. Picking up really where we left off this morning. I mentioned we, I might want to look at um, some of the events preceding his entering Jerusalem after further study and thought, I decided um, not to. There's a lot that could be said about Zacchaeus and about the parable of the pounds. I, I have preached that parable before, and for sake of time tonight, I wanted to just begin right here in chapter 19, picking up at the end of that Palm Sunday account. So Jesus has just pronounced that there is going to be judgment that's going to follow Jerusalem, and that saddens him that Jerusalem has responded to him, the Messiah, with rejection. Not obedience, not submission, and not joy or praise, but rather rejection. And he enters the temple Monday morning, where he will cleanse it and teach. And really we see three actions here. Uh, in these couple of days, Monday and Tuesday in that Passion Week, A.D. 33, in which we should learn how we need to be sure that we are following God's path for our lives, God's path for our service to him, God's path for our relationship with him, for our daily lives, for the direction our lives take. We must follow God's path rather than our own, rather than our own selfish purposes, as we are all prone to fall into. And so tonight we pick up right here in verse 45 of Luke chapter 19, with the first action of Jesus being the cleansing of the temple, where he confronts the evil that he finds there. Look at verse 45. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Notice that what is going on here, the selling of sacrifices, that was not that was not denied by the, the law. It, it was okay to be able to exchange money for the sacrifices if someone is coming from a long distance rather than to bring their lamb or bring their dove all the way from the land they're coming from. And as we saw in our study of Acts a few weeks ago when we began our Sunday evening services when we were still gathering together in this room on Sunday nights, we saw that all, from all the part, different parts of the Roman Empire, even Rome, parts of North Africa, Greece, um, Asia Minor, there were devout Jews gathering on the day of Pentecost. That means there's devout Jews from all over the Roman Empire also gathering here for the Passover, for the Passover week. And many of these people are coming from long distance are being taken advantage of by the scribes and by the priests at the temple. You see, they're requiring everyone to not only purchase a sacrifice, but to purchase it 
with the temple money, money that you could only get at the temple and you had to exchange whatever currency you were bringing at the rate determined by the priests and scribes. I think we can begin to see how that lends itself to the priests and scribes being able to take advantage of the situation to enrich themselves. And they did, and they did. That's why Jesus calls it a den of thieves. He knows the advantage they are taking of believing Gentiles and Jews from all over the Roman Empire gathering together for Passover. Also, the place, the location is wrong. There was, they were to be outside the court. They were to not be in the court of the Gentiles, which is where they are apparently selling these animals. The place that is designated for prayer. There's a court for the Gentiles, there's a court for the Jews. The temple itself is not where the prayer would take place. People would pray facing the temple. And Gentiles were not allowed to enter the temple at all. And we see that becomes a major issue with later in Paul. That's the accusation that leads him to traveling, appealing and traveling to Rome, uh, is that he, would, that he was supposed to have taken Titus in the temple. And of course, he didn't do that. But there, there was an uh, area designated for the Gentiles to worship in, and it seems that that is the area outside the temple where this marketplace has been set up with all these animals being sold for sacrifices and also the money changers exchanging the temple money for the currency being brought by the people at rates that were dishonest. Therefore, they were, they were involved in theft because they were not being honest. They were taking advantage of this Passover feast and polluting it, polluting the place, the very place it was to be for prayer, the house of prayer. And Jesus is rightfully angry. Anger itself is not a sin. Jesus has righteous indignation, righteous anger here, and he turns over the, uh, the money changers' tables, he, he turns out, he cleanses the temple, this is not the first time he's done this before. The priests and the scribes have seen this before. But now, he, he, would, he cast them out, he said, and, and would not allow them, as Matthew and Mark point out, would not allow them to carry anything into the temple, this merchandise that is going on here. The business. And how often today does business sometimes come between God and people, where people are taking advantage, even in the church today, taking advantage, even with televangelists and things on TV, asking for money, when really people should first be tithing to their local church, giving that to God, and that money should be going to its purpose of fulfilling the Great Commission. You're supporting the ministry of, of that church, the, the pastor there, missionaries, um, and uh, not wasting it. It's, we were to have be good stewards. But there's all kinds of parachurch organizations that crop up on TV and radio and, and that ask for money. And there's nothing wrong with giving to those things. But when it takes the place of the Great Commission has to be fulfilled by the church, by the local church, that becomes a problem. When people take advantage, um, and especially in this very twisted way, because these, these priests and these scribes aren't just asking for donations. They're demanding, they're requiring. In order for people to purchase their sacrifice, they must exchange their money for that of the temple money. Uh, and so they've become a den of thieves. The temple has become a den of thieves. You know, the, the temple itself was to be a picture of God's presence. That's what it was set up by in, uh, for in the Old Testament, beginning with the tabernacle in the wilderness, and then with Solomon's temple later as a permanent structure. Now a rebuilt temple and beautified under Herod the Great, rebuilt back under Ezra. And God takes pictures very seriously. We, we should take that into remembrance, into account right now. To think of Moses in the wilderness. God had a picture for Moses to be a part of. That was to strike the rock in one uh, situation, in one instance. 
Moses is to strike the rock and water comes from it, water of life. That was a picture of Jesus being stricken, being smitten for our sins and giving us the water of life through his death. But Jesus died once for sins, not twice. And so the second time Moses was to speak to the rock. But instead he smote the rock again. He hit it again with his staff, with his rod. And God did the second time bring water out of the rock. But Moses lost the reward, lost the privilege of entering in the promised land himself. He still was able to see it with his eyes from a mountain before he died, but he did not enter the promised land because God takes his, pure, his pictures very seriously. Another picture that God has for us today is marriage, Christ and the church. And when we pollute the picture of marriage today, God takes that very seriously. We need to be right with God. We need to be on God's path in every way of our life. In every aspect of our life, we need to be surrendering to him. And the church is a picture of his body. We're not to be fighting with each other, with different members of the church. We're to be fellowshipping, building one another up, working together of one mind, and serving the Lord, fulfilling his commission for the church as a picture of his body. God takes his pictures very seriously. And the temple was a picture of God's presence among the people. A place where, although God is present everywhere, here was a symbol, the temple, symbolizing God among his people. And God's people coming before God's presence with prayer and with sacrifices. And now with the merchandise being made by the scribes and Pharisees, that picture has been polluted. Jesus is rightly angry. And he casts them out. And notice the people and how they respond. And the chief priests, what their response is to Jesus here. We looked at responses this morning. And uh, notice the responses here. As Jesus cleanses the temple and then Jesus teaches in the temple. Look at verse 47. He taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes, the chief of the people, sought to destroy him. Not only were the priests rejecting Jesus, like many say today, well, that's not for me, but they were actively seeking to destroy Jesus. That's because they didn't want him to be considered authority greater than their own. They wanted the people to listen to them. Jesus was a threat to their power, to their authority, to their ability to make money, as you see here in the temple, when Jesus cast them out. And they weren't just going to take that. They were going to fight back. They already had been scheming and plotting against Jesus to arrest him, to take him. But they can't find a way to do so. You see, evil acts in the darkness. And in the, in the light of the day, in, in front of these crowds of people who the scribes and the priests themselves want to listen, want these people to be listening to them and enriching them, following them, they can't take Jesus. He's too popular. He is proven by his words that he's a good teacher, not just a good teacher, but he is the son of God. And he is giving plenty of evidence for that. And so to them, he is dangerous. And they were rejecting him as the son of God. They refuse. They are blind and uh, would le become leaders of the blind. So they tried to destroy him. They sought how they would destroy him. But look at verse 48. And could not find how they might do. For all the people were very attentive to hear him. Note the lesson, the application for us today here. Are we attentive to God's words? The people here in the temple daily were attentive during this last week of Jesus' ministry before his death and later resurrection. On that third day, the next Sunday, on this Monday, people are gathering to hear him. And on Tuesday as well, and daily the people are listening to him attentively. Are we attentive to the word of God? Do we listen to the preaching of God's word attentively? Do we listen to, whether it be an app, reading God's word to us attentively, or our own study? As we are so blessed in America to have the, the, such free access to the word of God, are we attentive to these words? The people here at the temple were attentive to hear him. Let's be attentive to hear God speak. He still speaks. 
through his word to us today. And he can speak to us daily, just as he did in the temple, if we will daily read his word. Let's be attentive to Christ's teaching and cleansing us still today with his word. Secondly, the second action we find with, with Jesus in this passage here, is that Jesus teaches daily. And while, while the, uh, while after um, cleansing the temple, while his enemies are seeking to destroy him, he continues to come back to the temple daily. He's there Monday, he's there again Tuesday. So Monday we see him cleanse the temple, we see him teaching the temple Monday, again he comes there daily, including Tuesday. Go to, if you would, if you have your Bibles at home, if you would turn to Luke chapter 21, in verse 37, Luke 21, 37. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple. He was teaching, and at night, he went out and abode the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. So Monday night, Tuesday night, he's going to the Mount of Olives. That reminds us of what he told us in, earlier in his min, earthly ministry. When, when people wanted to follow him, he mentioned he did not have a place to lay his head. Foxes have all holes and birds of the air have nests. He says in Luke 9, verse 58, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He did not have a home. He, was, he did not have a place to, to go to that night, but went to the Mount of Olives. They would go to the upper room later that week, but that would be to eat the Passover. And then later he'd go out to the Garden of Gethsemane and perhaps spend that night in a jail cell as he awaits trial before Pilate the next day after being tried in the middle of the night by the Sanhedrin. Jesus went daily to teach. Are we daily looking for opportunities to share God's word? Jesus was faithful while he was on earth to be that testimony, to be that witness, to be that teacher. But today he has commissioned us to be his hands and feet, to be his mouth. And notice as he was teaching, the people were diligent to hear him. They would rise early in the morning to hear Jesus. Look at verse 38. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him in the temple for to hear him. Do we come early to hear Jesus? Do we come early on Sunday morning for Sunday school? Um, any of you may, may normally attend other churches. If you're watching this on Facebook Live or if you're watching this later on Facebook or YouTube, do we rise early to get to church? Do we rise early to spend time in God's word to hear God as we already mentioned? God still teaches us today through the illumination of the Holy Spirit in his word to our hearts. The word of God is powerful. It's alive, sharper than any two-edged sword, discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart and dividing between the soul and the spirit. Uh, are we giving God that ability to work in our hearts and work in our lives through his word? Of course, the uh, chief priests, rather than listen to his word diligently as as the other people were doing in the temple each day, they were seeking to undermine that work, those words. And you know, Jesus, there's a picture given in Matthew and Mark. Tuesday, uh, Monday morning, as uh, Jesus entered Jerusalem, he, he came to a fig tree. He was hungry for breakfast, and he found a fig tree. They should have been some fruit there, even though it wasn't the full time for all of it to be ripe. There was no fruit at all. And so he cursed that fig tree. And that fig tree is a picture of Israel. They were not bearing the fruit that should have been there. And then later on Tuesday, Tuesday evening, they, they come back in uh, Mark 11, 19 through 25, and Matthew 21, 19 through 22, not, not recorded for us in Luke. And the disciples noticed that tree that was withered, and they asked Jesus about that.
But the priests and the scribes, they're like that fig tree in the nation of Israel as they reject Jesus as their Messiah. They are not bearing the fruit they're expected to bear. You know, we as believers were called upon to bear the fruit of the Spirit earlier, um, actually at the end of this past year, 2019, I preached through the fruit of the Spirit. We are to be bearing that fruit. And that tree that did not bear fruit was withered and died. We need to be bearing the fruit of the Spirit. The priests and the scribes, not only were they not bearing fruit, but they were seeking to destroy Jesus. They're seeking to undermine him. And now they question Jesus' authority. And Jesus answers those questions against his authority. He answers those attacks wisely. We see the power of his words, starting in verse 1 of Luke chapter 20. Turning back now to Luke 20, verse 1. And it came to pass on one of those days, this will be Tuesday, that on one of those days as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders and spake unto him, saying, Tell us by what authority doest thou these things, or who is he that gave thee this authority? And he answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or men? And they reasoned with themselves. So Jesus answers their question with a question, notice. He is not going to cast his pearls before swine here and, and let them turn and rend him. He doesn't tell them, my authority is from God, because he knows they're going to attack. So instead, he answers their question in such a way that they can't answer themselves. He says, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say, why then have ye believed him not? But and if we say of men, all the people will stone us, for they be persuaded that John was a prophet. So they're trapped. They can't say that John was a prophet because they didn't listen to him. And they can't say he's not a prophet because the people that they want to follow them and to enrich them, once Jesus is off the scene, of course, they need, to, they need to destroy him. Well, they would stone them if they said John the Baptist was not a prophet. Verse 6, but, and if we, um, verse 7, and they answered, and they could not tell whence it was. He, they told Jesus, we can't tell. We can't tell you. And so verse 8, Jesus said, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. You know, we, we have to be careful uh, when we're giving answers to people. And notice here, Jesus answers with a question. Sometimes the best way to answer a question that's just seeking to undermine, just seeking to disrupt is to answer with a question. Jesus does that here. Then he tells a story, and it illustrates who the scribes and the priests really are and what they're really doing. And it should convict them. It should turn them to repentance. But of course, it just angers them more. They know Jesus is talking about them, and the people can see the truth through this story. Let's look at that. The parable of the husband, then, verse 9 of Luke chapter 20. And then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen. So he rented it out to these tenants, these stewards, who are to serve him, who are to give him you know, the rent that is due him for using his land, which would be part of the produce, apparently, for the, from the vineyard. What belongs to him. This vineyard belongs to him, and he's allowing people to work it for him. These husbandmen. And then he went into a far country for a long time. And at the season, he sent a servant to the husbandmen. So it was harvest time. He's expecting to reap what is due to him. He sends the husbandmen that they should give of him the fruit of the vineyard, but the husbandmen beat 
him and sent him away empty, the messenger that is sent. And again, he sent another servant. They beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again, he sent a third and they wounded him and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they hear it, they said, and when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he beheld them and said, what is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. But on whom it shall fight, fall, it shall grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes, the same hour, sought to lay hands on him. And they, and they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. Yes, he did. This parable, and it, it really applies to anyone who rejects Jesus. In this parable, the tenants who are wicked and beat and even kill some of the servants that are sent, the messengers that are sent to them, are like the, the, the people of Israel, and especially the scribes and, and, and the uh, priests here, when the prophets are sent to them, when John the Baptist is sent to them, how did they treat them? Shamefully. And then when God's own son comes to them, they also kill him. But that doesn't convict, that doesn't stop the scribes and priests from doing just that later this week. But Jesus gives this warning. There's going to be a judgment come. There's going to be that grinding to powder that will come one day. But, but instead, they're seeking to lay hands on him. Then verse 20, the uh, scribes and Pharisees, they continue to try to question and to undermine Jesus, but to no avail because of how Jesus answers them. Verse 20, And they watched him and sent forth spies which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, and so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly, neither acceptest thou the person of any, but teachest the way of God truly. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? But he perceived their craftiness and said unto them, why tempt ye me? Show me a penny. Whose image and superscription hath it? And they answered, Caesar's. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar's the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. And to the, so today we are still to pay our taxes. You know, the, the presidents are on our coins, not a Caesar, but and of course, they're not the current president on our colors, but still, we're to give to the government their tax money. Uh, April 14th is coming up. We're to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. We're to give to God what belongs to him. The tithe, the tenth of, of everything that God gives to us through our wages, we're to give back to him today through our local church and that is how we were to support the great commission right here at, at our home front at our field that is white to harvest that also sends out missionaries and supports them through this church look at verse 26 and they could not take hold of his words before the people and they marveled at his answer and held their peace Jesus answered wisely. He's proving that they cannot, they cannot undermine his words. They cannot trick him. They cannot trap him. He is God. He knows their thoughts. He knows their real intentions. He answers with a question in one circumstance. He answers again with the question, whose image is on this coin? Bring a coin and gives the perfect answer and they can't catch him. You know, they thought they could catch him one way or the other. If he says, Pay taxes, that's not going to be popular. 
If he says, don't pay taxes, well, aha, they could take it to the Roman government. But no, he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, his image is on the coin, and to God the things that are God's. And they can't, they cannot undermine him with that answer. Verse 27, then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, now they're going to ask him about the resurrection because they don't believe that people live after they're dead. They believe once you're dead, you're dead. And that's it. That's over. There's still, still people that live, believe that today. And unfortunately they have, you know, uh, they're going to face reality one day and it, it's not going to be good. Look at uh, verse 28 now. One of these Sadducees that deny the resurrection exists comes to Jesus and he says, Master or teacher, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, because inheritance in the land, passing the family name down was so important that the land would continue to be inhabited by the descendants of each man's family. And so there was a provision of the law for this if a man died childless, if he die without children, his brother, his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother, raise up descendants, raise up, raise up descendants to take his inheritance. But now they ask him. Now they ask Jesus. There were seven brethren, and the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her to wife, and he died childless. And the third took her, and, the, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die anymore. And isn't that comforting? One, one day death is going to be over. But there's no marriage in heaven. We'll be like the angels, it says. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the, at the bush that when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, for he is the God of the, not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, and all live unto him. Notice Jesus knows what they're thinking, and they're thinking, see, the resurrection doesn't make sense. There can't be a resurrection of the dead. Once you're dead, that's it. And Jesus is pointing out, when, she, when God spoke to Moses at the burning bush, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had all died by that time. But God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And, and Jesus points out, God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're with God. They're alive. They're not dead. There is a resurrection of the dead. Unlike what the Sadducees were trying to get at by their questions, trying to trap and trick Jesus. Verse 39, then certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. Even the scribes have to admit when they're trying to trap Jesus, when they're trying to question him and test him, he has said well. Verse 40, after they durst not ask him any question at all, they don't dare ask him another question. It's just going to make themselves look foolish. It's going to re reveal their true motives, their true heart in asking these questions. And now Jesus answers further. And again, points out their real heart and their real motives and what the scribes and priests were really involved with and exposes them there for everyone. In verse 41, he said unto them, how say they that Christ is David's son? That's Christ is another word again for Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. And he, he asked them, how do they say that Christ is David's son? And David himself said in the book of Psalms, and this is in Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And David therefore called him Lord. How is he then his son? Jesus points out, David was speaking of the Messiah. He's speaking of the anointed one here. He's speaking of Christ. And he's calling him my Lord. 
So Jesus is greater. The Messiah is greater than just a descendant of David. He is David's Lord. He is sitting at the right hand of God, and his enemies are being made his footstool by his heavenly Father. He is God, the Son, who comes to the earth and becomes man so that he can take our place on the cross. He can take our punishment upon ourselves, on himself. Verse 45, then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, beware of the scribes, which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at the feast. They like the best seats. They like to be seen by people. They like to look good to people. And there's still people today in churches today that they like to look good. But what's in the heart? What are they really accomplishing for God? And what are they doing for themselves? Are they choosing God's path for their life or their own selfish one? Are we today, let's ask ourselves, each of us, in our daily lives, are we following our own selfish path or are we truly seeking and following God's path, God's way for our lives. Verse 47, Jesus points out what the scribes and Pharisees are doing. They devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. So they're taking, they're putting widows out of their houses and taking ownership, you know, foreclosing on these widows, the priests and scribes are. And yet they will for show, make a long prayer. The same shall receive greater judgment, greater damnation, Jesus says. And then to contrast further, the scribes and Pharisees to widows like the ones that they're putting out of their houses right here in, in the following chapter, verse one. And he looked up, Jesus looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, of a truth, I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. A mite is just a very tiny little coin. I have one. Uh, I didn't bring it out here, but uh, back in, in one of the classrooms. And it is smaller than a dime. If you can imagine a dime. And it's a little smaller than that, like a little piece of copper. A widow's mite. Two mites. It's all she had left. And that the rich men were making a show of bringing their money and slowly and you know, prestigiously um, pouring their money into the treasury. And yet they had so much that what they were really giving wasn't that much. They made it look like it. They made, every, made sure everyone was watching when they put it in. But the widow, she was truly giving to God because she was giving even though it was two little mites. She gave everything she had. Jesus points out the real nature of his enemies, how they were really following their own selfish path for their life, to enrich themselves, to take advantage for their own betterment, not to truly serve and worship God, not to advance God's kingdom. Otherwise, they should have, they should have recognized their Messiah in Jesus. Instead, they want to destroy him. And later that week, they will bring him before a secret and illegal council, the Sanhedrin, condemn him to death, and take him to Pilate and demand that he be crucified, which Pilate will finally give in and do. Um, I'd, I'd like to, you to join me um, this Wednesday. Um, it's Wednesday evening, about 6.30, through either the Zoom link that's on our website or also uh, Facebook Live. And then later I'll post a recording to YouTube at that time. But let's ask ourselves again tonight, looking back at this passage we've looked at in Luke for Monday and Tuesday of that Passion Week. Are we following the path that God has for us, or our own selfish one each day? Jesus, he confronted the evil and selfish path of the scribes and priests at the temple, and he cleansed the temple, and he taught the people. And the people were attentive to hear his words, and they would come daily to hear his words. 
and his words could not be overthrown. He could not be trapped in his words by his enemies. His words are still recorded for us. They are still perfect in his word, the Bible today. Are we spending time each day rising early to hear him teach us from his word? Are we gathering, even at home now, we have to gather at home, to hear God's word taught through preachers. There's so many available now through the internet. Of course, make sure that they're teaching the Bible. That it's, not, it's not just a show. That it's real. If it's being, the teaching is faithful to God's word as Jesus was, because he is the word of God. He is God's son. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. That's John 1, 1 and 2. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would live by every word of God. As Jesus answered Satan in his temptation after 40 days in the wilderness, Luke 4, verse 4. Every word of God. Lord, I pray that we would live by your word, that we would follow your path for our life. I pray here, if anyone is following their own path now, and sometimes even as your children, we get off on the, the wrong path, the easy path, like um, Pilgrim and Hopeful at one time did, and then ended up in that doubting despair and that uh, great epic uh, literature, Pilgrim's Progress. Lord, I pray that we would stay on that straight and narrow path that you have for us in your word, that we would daily be coming to the teachings of your word, that we would diligently Come to the preaching of your word and listen attentively to what you have there for us. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray that we will follow its path. We will make it a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We thank you for your perfect word. We thank you for how you will guide us through even this coronavirus crisis that we're going through right now and that we would allow you to guide us through it by your words, that your words would give us the peace and the strength we need to face each day and to be a light for you and the world around us every day, even when this crisis passes. And we pray that it will pass soon, Lord. We pray you'd be with each of each one listening now and anyone who has friends or family who are at risk or perhaps even have become ill, that you'd be with them and provide the healing, the strength, the protection that each one needs the supplies that each one needs, and Lord, the peace and the closeness to you that we need. And if anyone here has never trusted you as their Savior, I pray that we would seek out the truth in your word and the gospel of John and the book of Romans. They would contact us and let us know how we can pray, how we can show the way through your word and what you have revealed in your word about heaven, hell, life, death, and yourself. I pray that we would have that perfect relationship that would be growing each day in you and through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us through uh, this recording or even through this live stream on, on Facebook. And have a good evening. Again, uh, 6.30 Wednesday will be the next live stream. And we'll see you then. And we'll look forward to when we can gather again in this room.